Hi there, I'm Aurélien Geron, and in this video, I'll introduce a natural language processing or NLP. But before I start, a quick word about the context of this video. I'm recording it in Auckland in New Zealand for my friends over in Nigeria in the School of AI of Port Harcourt City. Uh, I hope you're all doing great there and staying safe from the virus. If you're watching this video in Port Harcourt and you've not yet joined the School of AI, you really should. It's a very dynamic nonprofit organization which is dedicated to making machine learning and data science um, accessible to all. As a side note, I actually lived in Port Harcourt uh, as a child for about three years and my earliest memories are actually from the city. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay. I'll begin with a walkthrough of the main tasks, uh, datasets, and metrics in NLP with a few words about how to load the datasets using TensorFlow Datasets, or TFDS. Then I'll present the main neural network architectures used to tackle these tasks, including uh, recurrent neural networks and more recently the transformer architecture, which has spawned a revolution in the field. So natural language processing is a fairly broad field of research and engineering, which tries to give computers the ability to process spoken or written language or generate text, for example, to answer questions using natural language. One example is sentiment analysis. Here's a, a review someone wrote about the movie Inside Out on the Internet Movie Database, IMDb. Reading this review, even just the title, An Artistic Triumph, it's pretty clear that it's a positive review. In fact, the author of the review rated the movie nine stars out of 10. If we get thousands of reviews from the IMDb website, we can train a neural network to predict whether a review is positive or negative just based on the text. We can use the number of stars as the label during training. And such a model could be useful to automatically gather the sentiments about a movie across all internet comments and blogs, not just on specialized websites. Now, sentiment analysis can be useful in many other ways. Uh, they could be used in a recommender system, for example, to tell you which restaurant to go to based on what people say about this restaurant on the web. Another example is to automatically analyze financial articles to determine how positive or negative people feel about the market or about specific companies. And you can easily imagine many more applications. If all the model is going to do is classify text as positive or negative, uh, then it's just a subset of the more general text classification task. You can imagine how useful text classification models can be to automatically organize large amounts of documents, such as in a public library or in search engines. Now, before I present more NLP tasks, I'd like to say a few words about the NLP datasets and how to load them. A nice tool for that is TensorFlow datasets. You can install it using this pip command, then just import TensorFlow datasets, usually as TFDS, and then call the load function to load the dataset you want, such as the IMDB reviews dataset. When TFDS loads a dataset, it's generally already split into a train set and a test set. In the case of the IMDB reviews dataset, each split contains 25,000 reviews. The load function returns a dictionary containing each split. Alternatively, you can specify the splits you want when calling the load function. And in this case, the function returns the splits as a list, like this. Each dataset may have multiple versions, so you can specify the version you want like this. If you only want to work on a subset of a split, for example, if you only want the first 60% of the test set, then you can specify it like this. This can be useful if you want to use part of the test split for testing and the rest for validation, like this. Now, each split is represented as a TensorFlow dataset using the tf.data API. By default, each instance is represented as a dictionary containing all the input features. And if it's a supervised learning task, the dictionary also contains the labels. In this case, you may find it more convenient to have each instance represented as a tuple pair containing the input features on the one hand and the labels on the other. In this case, you must specify as supervised equals true like this. All right, now let's take a look at a couple of instances from the train set. 
since we specified as supervised equals true, each instance in the dataset is represented as a tuple pair containing the inputs and the label. In this case, the inputs are just the review's text. It's actually a TensorFlow tensor containing a UTF-8 encoded byte string. So we need to call the NumPy method to get the byte string, then decode it before we can use it. And the label is just an integer tensor equal to one if the review is positive or zero if it's negative. You can check out the datasets that TFDS uh, offers at tensorflow.org slash datasets slash catalog. You'll find many popular NLP datasets, many of which are used in research papers to benchmark NLP models. For example, if you want a translation dataset, such as uh, German to English, then you can load the corresponding WMT uh, dataset, so that's Workshop on Machine Translation, and it's actually 10 gigabytes large. Uh, if you're interested in automatic summarization, uh, you'll find datasets such as MultiNews. The model gets a long piece of text, in this case a news article, and it must output a short summary. And TFDS also contains question answering datasets. The model is given some text, called the context, and a question about the context, and it must give the right answer. One of the most popular question answering datasets is Squad from the Stanford University, and you can easily load it using TensorFlow datasets. Some of the questions are very challenging for a machine, and they require some common sense or a good understanding of what the text is about. There are also datasets for other NLP tasks, uh, such as semantic equivalence. The goal here is to try to figure out whether two sentences are equivalent. For example, the sentence, Alice lost her keys, is generally equivalent to the sentence, Alice could not find her keys. If you're interested in semantic equivalence, you can load the Microsoft Research Paraphrase Corpus, or MRPC. Another NLP task is entailment. It's about figuring out whether one sentence entails another or contradicts it, or whether it's just neutral, meaning independent. For example, the sentence, Alice lost her keys, but Betty found them and returned them to her, entails the sentence, Alice got her keys back. Uh, but it contradicts the sentence, Alice lost her keys forever. And it's neutral with regards to the sentence, Alice and Betty are sisters. These facts are just independent. Once again, Stanford University built a great dataset for this called the Stanford Natural Language Inference Dataset, or SNLI, which you can load easily using TensorFlow datasets. Co-reference resolution is another NLP task where the model must try to find text segments that refer to the same thing. A famous example is given by this sentence, the trophy would not fit in the brown suitcase because it was too big. What does the word it refer to? the trophy or the brown suitcase. For us humans, it's pretty obvious that it refers to the trophy. Uh, the trophy is too big, which explains why it doesn't fit. But if we replace the word big with the word small, then the word it now refers to the brown suitcase. The trophy would not fit because the suitcase was too small. This sentence nicely illustrates how difficult NLP can be since it involves not only syntax, grammar, and language structure, but also a significant knowledge and understanding about the world, basically common sense. If you're interested in co-reference resolution, you can check out Google's GAP or GAP dataset. Now, there are many other NLP tasks. I can't list them all here, but here's just a few more. Information extraction is about reading some text and extracting structured information from it, typically in the form of a graph like this. Alice was born in Legos, she's married to Bob, and so on. Now, speech-to-text is also considered as part of NLP. You speak to the computer and it writes down what you're saying. The reverse is also considered part of NLP. The computer reads text out loud, and we're all getting used to these applications of NLP in our lives, but just a few years ago it was science fiction. Or at least it really didn't work as well as it does today. And lastly, optical character recognition, or OCR, is also part of NLP. The goal is to build a system that can read text, written text, whether it's handwritten or printed. So as you can see, over the years, the field of NLP has split into many specialized subfields. Now let's talk about metrics and benchmarks. In order to evaluate and compare NLP models, a number of standardized datasets and metrics have been created. 
For example, here is an extract from a recent paper which compares various models across several metrics. The General Language Understanding Evaluation, or GLU, benchmark measures the ability of the model to understand text. This is called Natural Language Understanding, or NLU. The metric is based on several datasets containing pairs of sentences, each with a different task to perform, including sentiment analysis, semantic equivalence, co-reference resolution, question answering, and more. For comparison, humans typically get a score of about 87 on this task. So you can see that machines are not that far off now. But the benchmark was a bit too simple for machines, so a more difficult benchmark for NLU was created. Uh, it's called Super Glue, the Super Glue benchmark, inspired by Glue. It's uh, significantly harder for machines, as you can see by the lower scores here. And humans are actually a bit better at this one than Glue, reaching a score of about 90 on this benchmark. The CNN Daily Mail, or CNN DM, is benchmark based on the data set of the same name. It's used to benchmark summarization models. The dataset contains about 300,000 online news articles from CNN and the Daily Mail, along with short summaries of these articles. So to evaluate a model, the benchmark looks at each generated summary and uses the Rouge metric to measure how similar uh, it is to the target summaries. The Rouge metric measures the amount of overlap between the generated summary and the target summary. It has several variants, but uh, I won't get into these. Um, the squad benchmark is based on the question answering dataset that I discussed earlier. And lastly, the columns on the right show translation metrics from English to German, English to French, and English to Romanian. Translation metrics are often based on the datasets uh, from the workshop on machine translation, WMT, using a metric called the Bilingual Evaluation Under Study, or BLU. This metric measures the similarity between the generated translation and the target translations. There are other important metrics and benchmarks, but hopefully this gives you a good idea of the kinds of things that researchers are trying to optimize. All right, so far we've done a tour of the main NLP tasks. Uh, we've looked at some popular datasets and how to load them using TensorFlow datasets, and we've discussed a bit about the metrics. Now it's time to discuss how exactly people tackle NLP tasks, starting with uh, recurrent neural networks. Recurrent neural networks have been around for decades, and they've been the state of the art for NLP for several years, until pretty recently. Uh, so in a regular feedforward neural net, the inputs X go through one or more layers, and we get the prediction Y hat. The signal only flows in one direction, from the inputs to the outputs. In contrast, the outputs of a recurrent neural network get fed back to the network, hence the name recurrent. More precisely, at each time step, the network gets both the inputs from the current time step t and the outputs from the previous time step t minus 1. With this architecture, instead of feeding the network a single input, we can feed it a sequence of inputs at, of any length we want, uh, one input at a time. This is why RNNs are so popular to handle sequential data, including text, which is just a sequence of words. A group of layers that feeds its outputs back to itself is called uh, an RNN cell, or a memory cell. More generally, the cell can feed any data back to itself. It doesn't have to be the outputs. The vector H is called the state vector of the cell. By far the most popular cell today is the long short-term memory cell, or LSTM. I won't get into the details right now, but suffices to say that it helps the RNN handle longer sequences. The other popular cell is the GRU cell, which is a bit simpler and has slightly less parameters. Uh, several RNN cells can be stacked up like this, resulting in a deep RNN. If we use the horizontal axis to represent time, we can see how the signal propagates through the RNN at each time step. At time step 0 on the left, the first inputs x0 get fed to the cell, and it outputs y hat 0. Then at time step 1, the inputs x1 get fed to the cell, along with the state vector from the previous time step, and the cell produces its second output, y hat 1, and the process can go on as long as we want. For the time step 0, there's no previous state vector, so what should we feel the cell? We, by default, we typically feed it a 0 vector. 
but in some cases it's preferable to feed it the value of a trainable variable, and in other cases we feed it the last state of another RNN, as we will see shortly. This is actually how RNNs are trained. They are unrolled through a number of time steps and then trained like normal feed-forward net networks using backpropagation. You can see that the gradients flow back through the network and through time. Here's what a deep RNN looks like when we unroll it through time. To be clear, there is just two cells here, not six. It's the same two cells that get reused at each time step. Okay, and here's how we can use a deep RNN to perform sequence classification. We just feed in the sequence and we ignore all the RNN's outputs except for the last one and they go through a dense layer with one unit per class and the softmax activation function. This is called a, a sequence to vector uh, model. This way we can feed a sequence in the RNN and we get back an estimated probability for each class. We can then train the network using the cross entropy loss. Now if we can just figure out uh, how to feed text into this architecture then we can perform sentiment analysis. Now, neural networks expect numbers, not text. So we need to pre-process the text so that it becomes a sequence of tokens, and such as words or parts of words or even characters. Then each token can be represented by its index in the vocabulary of all possible tokens. Um, so here I've represented love as number 55, this as number 13, and movie as number 99. Then we can feed these numbers through an embedding layer. Uh, this embedding layer will return a different trainable vector for each token ID. This allows the RNN to gradually learn a good vector representation for each token. And that's it. This is a perfectly valid RNN for sentiment analysis. Well, if there are just two classes, positive or negative, then you want a single unit in the output layer, and you want to use the sigmoid activation function instead of the softmax activation function. Okay, now let's look at automatic translation. A common architecture for automatic translation is this encoder-decoder architecture. Uh, here's a very, very basic version. Uh, the input sentence to be translated, such as uh, I drink milk, is first tokenized and passed through an embedding layer. Then the result is fed to the encoder, which is just a regular RNN. The outputs of the encoder are just ignored, at least in this basic version of the architecture but the final state of the encoder is fed as the initial state to the decoder, which is also regular RNN. The decoder's job is to produce the translation, one token at a time, ending with a special end-of-sequence token, or EOS. Specifically, at each time step, it estimates the probability of each possible output token. In a very basic translation system, it would just greedily output the most likely word at each time step but a smarter system can try to find the most likely sequence of words. This is called beam search. It's done at inference time, not training time. Now, if we just train this model, it won't work very well. It needs a bunch of tweaks. The first tweak is to feed the target sentence to the decoder after shifting it by one time step. This is why the decoder's inputs start with a go token, also called the start of sequence token, or SOS. With this technique, at each time step, the decoder will get as input the word that it should have predicted at the previous time step. This is called teacher forcing. And it helps the neural network learn during training. But after training, when we want to translate a new piece of text, we won't have the labels. And that's okay, because at each time step, we can just feed the decoder the word that it actually predicted at the previous time step. Unfortunately, the encoder-decoder architecture uh, produces disappointing results when it tries to translate long sentences. Indeed, if you look at the path of the word, for example, milk, up to its translation, le lait, you will notice that it goes through many computation steps. Uh, the RNN must remember the word milk for a long time before it produces the translation. Moreover, it must remember many other words at the same time. This makes it very hard for the encoder-decoder to produce good translations for even moderately long sentences. This is where attention mechanisms come in. 
They were introduced in a 2014 paper called uh, Neural Machine Translation by Jointly Learning to Align and Translate by Dmitry Badenau, uh, Kyung Hyun Cho, and Joshua Bengio. This paper proposed a very important tweak to the encoder-decoder architecture. The basic idea is to let the decoder look directly at the outputs of the encoder, focusing its attention on the right word or group of words at each time step. For example, when the decoder must output the second word, since it just translated the subject I, it can guess that it must now output a verb. So it searches the encoder's outputs to find the output that corresponds to a verb and it finds the output for the word drink in this case. This output gets fed as an extra input to the decoder, and of course this dramatically helps the decoder choose the right word. When the decoder is about to produce the next word, the attention mechanism feeds it the appropriate encoder output, corresponding to the word that it should translate now. In this case, it outputs le, then, uh, les. The attention mechanism provides a much more direct path from an input word to its translation, which allows it to handle much longer sentences. Note that the attention mechanism actually looks at every single encoder output and gives each one a score, called an alignment score. For example, it might be 0.1 for the first word, 0.2 for the second word, and 0.7 for the third word. The scores add up to 1. Then what actually gets fed to the decoder is the weighted sum of the encoder's outputs. All right, but now you might wonder why we even need an encoder. Can't the decoder just look directly at the word embeddings from the input sentence? Well, that wouldn't work very well. Indeed, many words have multiple meanings which depend on the context. For example, the word drink could mean the verb, as in I drink milk, or it could mean the noun, as in let's have a drink. Let's take a look at what the word embeddings may look like. Each word embedding is just a learned vector. Here I'm pretending that the word embeddings are just two-dimensional vectors, but in reality they typically have hundreds of dimensions. Now let's imagine that the neural network learned to identify food-related words and verbs. Uh, I and milk are not verbs, although milk can be a verb, but the noun is much more common. Uh, the word drink is somewhere in the middle, because the noun and the verb are equally common. And the words uh, drink and milk are food-related, while the word I is not. As you can see, the word drink is not clearly identified as a verb, when taken out of context. But the encoder sees that the word drink follows the word I, so it can safely assume that the word drink is used as a verb. So it can transform the word embedding to push it further along the verb axis. Now, when the decoder is about to output the second word, hopefully the state vector indicates that a verb is expected next. This state vector is used as the query to look for the appropriate input word. The query is this vector in red, which is asking for a verb, and which is neutral about the fact that it's food related or not. Now we can compute the similarity between the query and each word representation, and then we can normalize them so that they add up to one. And this gives us the alignment scores. We see that the word drink has the highest alignment score we can now compute the weighted sum of the encoded word representation, and this gives us the attention input to the decoder for this step. Okay, so you can see that the encoder's role is to transform the word representations of the input sentence based on their context. This makes it much easier for the decoder to find the input words that it should pay attention to uh, when producing the next word of the translation. And this idea of gradually transforming word representation is at the core of the transformer architecture. So we'll leave RNNs behind now and talk about uh, the transformer architecture. This architecture was introduced in the groundbreaking paper Attention is All You Need by a team of Google researchers. Uh, this is what it looks like. There is still an encoder on the left and a decoder on the right. Embeddings at the bottom and a dense layer with a softmax uh, activation function at the output of the decoder in the top right. However, there's no RNN anymore. 
They have been replaced with a mix of simple feed-forward layers and special attention layers called multi-head attention layers. In the encoder, these layers gradually transform the word representations, so they end up being most useful for the decoder. And in the decoder, the layers gradually transform the decoder's inputs until they end up close to the translated word's uh, representation. Now let's see how that works. Consider the word bat. Uh, it could mean a baseball bat or just the animal. But now suppose the full sentence is, the bat was sleeping. When this sentence goes through the multi-head attention layer, the word bat gets compared to every single word in this sentence, including itself. This is called self-attention. Obviously, the word bat is perfectly similar to itself. I've represented this with the thick black arrow. On the other hand, the words the and was are pretty different. But the word sleeping is slightly similar in the sense that bat and sleeping can both be animal-related. So when the attention layer computes the weighted sum of the word representations, uh, the result is close to the original representation of the word bat, but pushed in the animal-related direction. Now the multi-head attention layer does the exact same thing in parallel for all words in the sentence. The word representations all get transformed based on the context. Let's go back to the architecture. We see that uh, the encoder is on the left and the decoder on the right. But note that these components are repeated n times. In the paper, they use n equals 6. So here's what the architecture really looks like. Uh, this means that each word representation gets transformed many times, which gives it the opportunity to become quite a rich representation. Also note that the outputs of the encoder are fed to the decoder at every level. Uh, so the information does not get diluted as it traverses the decoder. So let's go through the whole process of translation uh, using the full transformer. Going through the encoder's first self-attention layer, the word bat gets transformed a bit, as we saw earlier. And in parallel, so does the word sleeping, as well as all the other words in the sentence. Then the word representations go through a couple feet-forward layers, then through another self-attention layer, which continues to improve the word representations uh, based on the context. And the process is repeated several times, six in all, but I'm just showing four here. Now, let's look at what happens on the decoder side. We feed it the target sentence as input, shifted to the right, just like earlier, with the start of sequence token at the beginning. This sentence goes through a self-attention layer, just like in the encoder, except that it's a masked attention layer, which does not allow a word to pay attention to the words located after it. For example, the word souris is compared to the words la, chauve, and souris, but not to the word dormez, since dormez is located after souris. This prevents the decoder from cheating by looking at the next words that it's supposed to predict. Just like in the encoder, all words get transformed in parallel based on all the other words, except for those located after them, of course. For example, the word la gets compared to itself and to the start of sequence uh, token. And each word also goes through a couple of feed forward layers independently from the other words. Next, the decoder applies another attention layer, but this time it queries the encoder's outputs rather than itself. Each word representation in the decoder is used as a query to search for the best words in the encoder's outputs. So, for example, if the decoder is smart enough, after the word souris, it may expect a verb. So, if it did its job properly, the word representation for the word souris now contains the fact that it should be followed by a verb. With this query, the, uh, the encoder's outputs for the words was and sleeping are the best matches, and the word souris gets pulled strongly in this direction, effectively approaching the word representation of the next word, dormez. The decoder continues to apply attention layers, alternating between uh, self-attention and attending to the encoder outputs. By the time the word representations reach the end of the decoder, they've been transformed so much that they now look like the word representations of the target words. Okay, so this is what happens during training, but what about inference? Well, just like for the regular encoder-decoder architecture, we can just use the model to predict one word at a time. We start with the SOS token, and the model hopefully predicts the, words, the first word, la. 
Then we append this word to the decoder's input sentence, and we run the model again. And hopefully it predicts the word shov. We append it to the input sentence, and so on. Why are the attention layers called multi-head attention layers? Uh, it's really a technical detail that you don't necessarily need to know about. A multi-head attention layer runs multiple computations in parallel, called heads. Each head starts by a linear layer, which projects the word representations and the query down to a lower number of dimensions. For example, one head may project the word representations and the query onto the food-related axis. Then it works like a normal attention layer, computing the similarity between the query and each word, and then computing the weighted sum of the word representations to get the attention input. While another head may project the word representations and the query onto the verb axis, this allows the multi-head attention layer to look for specific things about words, such as, is it a verb, without getting polluted by all the information available in the other dimensions. The outputs of all the heads get concatenated uh, back together, and they go through a final dense layer, and this forms the output of the multi-head attention layer. Now we've gone through almost all of the transformer architecture, except for a few details. First, what are the positional encodings for? Well, if they did not exist, the model would have no way to take into account the position of a word in the sentence. Indeed, the multi-head attention layers compare each word with every single word in the sentence, regardless of its position. And all other layers, including the embedding layers and the feed-forward layers, treat the words completely independently from each other. So the position information is not available anywhere unless we explicitly add it to the word representations. This is what this part of the model does. It essentially adds the position of each word to its word representation so the model can have access to this information and use it in any way it wants. Uh, the other detail is the skip connections. The inputs of the attention layers are added to their outputs, followed by our layer normalization step. The same is true for the feedforward layers. Adding the inputs to the outputs is a common technique uh, called a skip connection or residual connection. Both this skip connection and the layer normalization step help the model train faster. And that's it for the transformer architecture. So before I conclude this presentation, I have to mention that the transformer architecture has sparked a revolution in the field of NLP over the last couple of years. Uh, for example, there was uh, OpenAI's GPT model in June 2018, followed by Google's BERT model in October 2018, then GPT-2 in February 2019, and Transformer Excel in January uh, 2019. ExcelNet in June, Roberta in July, and T5 in October, and Microsoft's Turing NLG just a couple months ago. With all these models, the state of the art in NLP has considerably advanced, uh, often reaching or even exceeding human level in some tasks. Uh, but the use of the transformer architecture is not the only reason for these advances. Uh, let's take BERT, for example. Compared to previous RNN-based models, it uses a huge number of parameters, about 110 million. But uh, this is nothing compared to the latest models. For example, Microsoft's Turing NLG model has a whopping 17 billion parameters. To train so many parameters, the data sets had to be absolutely gigantic. Uh, the idea is that you use a model that was pre-trained by someone with deep enough pockets and kind enough to make the weights available for free, and then you fine-tune it on your own data set. Some of the more recent models are actually so good after pre-training uh, that they barely need any fine-tuning at all uh, on some tasks. Another improvement is the use of subword tokenization techniques. Instead of coding each word using a single ID, words are broken down into smaller chunks. Uh, this makes it possible for the model to learn things like the fact that the suffix uh, est, as in longest or highest, uh, means the most. This can help it understand the meaning of words uh, more easily, as well as uh, the links between words, and it also helps it understand words it has never seen during training. Lastly, BERT uses a single architecture to tackle all NLP tasks. This allows it to transfer what it learns in one task to another task. For example, for semantic equivalence or entailment, you would feed the two sentences to the model with a separator token in between, and you would train the model to output the appropriate class uh, as the first output token. 
For text classification, uh, you would just pass in a single sentence. The T5 model went even further by treating all NLP tasks as text-to-text -text tasks. For example, if you feed the model uh, the sentence translate English to German, that is good, it will output das ist gut. If you input cola sentence the course is jumping well, it will output not acceptable because the sentence the course is jumping well does not make sense. If you want to learn more, you can check out my book, especially chapters 15 and 16. Uh, the notebooks containing all the code in these chapters are open source and available in my GitHub repo, uh, Hands-On ML2. And that's all I had. I hope you enjoyed this talk and I'll see you later. Thank you very much for watching and stay safe. Bye-bye.